uh, mini talk. And so what we're going to do this afternoon, uh, this particular talk was uh, was based on a convention and a study convention in Boaz, Alabama on the Beatitudes. And I was assigned one of the Beatitudes, but this will be like a uh, Cliff Notes version of all of the Beatitudes and hopefully summarized many of the lessons that we learned. We find the Beatitudes, the setting for them given to us in John 4, 12 and 13. And it talks about departing Galilee uh, into Galilee and leaving Nazareth. And this is a picture that actually shows you the Sea of Galilee. And in the distance, you can see the Mount where Nazareth is. And it's, it's quite a distance. Uh, and then they, he came to dwell in the seacoast. And of course, he had many followers. They're called disciples. These are not all of the apostles because he was still in the process of calling them out. But in any case, he was followed by what he described as a great multitude. And so many lessons were given and many miracles were performed. Now, the word Beatitudes means blesseds. And really, when we look at the Beatitudes, those who partake of these things are blessed. And it's really a, uh, a framework for building a character that will be a blessing to others as well. For This is one of the times when Jesus uh, spoke very directly and didn't use parables. And much of what he gave was contrary to worldly wisdom. And we would expect that because this was to his footstep followers. Uh, and they taught character attributes and then associated a blessing with each of them. And so we're going to kind of go through them. And, and really, it was laying out the, uh, the requirements for discipleship, wasn't he? Now, we had the picture of the multitudes, and it says, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And this is Mount Arbel. You can see in the distance the Sea of Galilee and the hills where we believe many of those lessons were, um, were given. But it says he went up into a mountain. And if you were in that area of the Sea of Galilee and you looked up, there are two mountains here. Elsewhere, they're referred to as the horns. And the one on the right is Mount Arbel. And then there's one on the left as well. And so naturally, if you say he went into a mountain, this is likely the place where the Beatitudes were given. And I like to think that because we have we were on a trip to Israel and we saw it. It was just a beautiful, beautiful location. And his disciples came up after him. And, you know, it's somewhat, uh, somewhat expected that, you know, if you went up, this is some 800 feet above the Sea of Galilee, that not those great multitudes wouldn't follow, and but just those that were very interested would. And so we like to think that he was sitting there, he opened his mouth, and he taught them these lessons. And he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are they that mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who do hunger and thirst after righteousness, blessed are the merciful and the pure in heart and the peacemakers. And so the, like, once again, this was contrary to the spirit of of the world, the things that he was saying. And so I, I think this was a wonderful teachable moment. If you can imagine being up on that precipice, overlooking the entire Sea of Galilee and all the area below, and then hearing these lessons, I, I would think in such a circumstance that these would be etched in your memory forever. And as we indicated, a number of the disciples that, that would become apostles had been called out, not all of them yet. That's the indication. But you know, many of them. And so this would be something that would be etched in their minds and that they would no doubt share with the other apostles as they came along as well. And so the first one was, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And this poor means destitute. It means there's nothing there. And so, you know, like anything, when there's a vacuum, it allows something to come in. And that spirit there is the word pneuma, which means spirit and quite often is referred to as the Holy Spirit. And so those that are destitute of the spirit of this world are really receptive to the Holy Spirit coming in. And theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, <clears throat> being poor of spirits allows space for the Holy Spirit to come in, as we've already indicated. And, you know, as we think about it, uh, there are many uh, scriptures that we could look at that kind of give us some insight into this. Don't think you're better than you are. Uh, evaluate yourself honestly. 
and measure yourselves by the faith that God has given us. And, you know, in our time, especially, uh, wealth is an indication of power and, and position and prestige. But, you know, we're told in Revelation 3.17, don't say that I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing, because in fact, you are destitute. So it's uh, especially a lesson for us in our time to uh, not get puffed up because we have material wealth. And kind of the opposites of this would be humility versus pride. So we're going to add, uh, don't be proud, be poor in spirit or humble. Um, you know, destitution is really the, the prerequisite to approaching God. He can't deal with pri proud people. And it gives us a sense of utter dependence on God as well. And we know there are scriptures that God resists the proud and that he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And so we see that this is kind of the entryway into approaching God and really into discipleship or apostleship with God. The next one is blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. And comfort here means the word grieve. Those are those that have, uh, have been empathetic and sympathetic. And it really marks this transition from a stony heart to a sympathetic heart. And remember in Jesus's day, especially that there were so many that had hard hearts. And I think we see that again in our world today. And, and we're saying, no, you need a symp sympathetic, tender heart that can grieve and can empathize with others. And we know we have this despite the fact, you know, when someone dies, we, we sorrow, but we don't do it as others because we have a spiritual lens. We know that all things work together for good. We know that there's nothing permitted that isn't for our good and edification. And so these are all prerequisites. So we have to be able to be to mourn versus being unsympathetic. Well, the world we're in today is very unsympathetic. It's your problem. Everybody's concerned about themselves. And so we add that. The opposite of mourning is, is uh, being unsympathetic. And, <clears throat> you know, in order to be a mourner, you've got to be uh, in, uh, in harmony with God's will. And you have to have a perspective, a, a spiritual perspective that really gives us that peace that passeth all understanding. And we have to be sympathetic to the human condition condition, even when uh, we're not in agreement with it. For instance, with regards to the conflict in Ukraine, we are sympathetic to both sides uh, because we realize there are tragedies occurring on both sides and they need to be comforted. And as a result, we receive a blessing and heavenly comfort that we can't receive any other way. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth and the meek are designated as submissive, patient, and controlled. These were three of the attributes that were brought out in the study. And really, it's all three of these that are necessary in order to be meek and, by extension, uh, teachable. And their promise, they shall inherit the earth. So meekness is required in order to be teachable. And of course, there are many scriptures as well on this point that we could get into, but we'll just highlight a couple that the spirit of God is upon me unto the meek. Once again, linking directly this meekness as, as a critical element. Uh, and as well for teachers, they have to teach in meekness, instructing those that oppose them, even themselves. And so we realize what a critical element this is in these steps. So we've got meekness on one side versus arrogance on the other side. And we know we live in an arrogant, proud world, don't we? So meekness is really gentle, patient submission to God's will. You know, sometimes God says, uh, we ask him, he says, not yet. Sometimes he says yes, and sometimes he says no. And we need to joyfully acquiesce to whatever God's will is because of that Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to the called according to his purpose. And we must be meek to be teachable as well as to uh, work with those and teach those in the world. And this is really contrary. Once again, these things are contrary to the spirit of the world, at least at this time. 
Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. And to hunger is to really suffer want of, of sustenance. And to thirst is a, another thing that is just really, really uh, important. And the point on this is that only the righteous can approach God. That's it. That's what it requires. And so we see, I don't know if any of you have ever been really uh, thirsty. I had one experience in desert hiking where I was very close. I was approaching heat exhaustion. And all you can think about is your thirst. And it saps all of your attention and your desires and so forth. And your total focus is on satisfying that thirst. And that's, I think, why this was used as a picture, because everyone in this desert land uh, was used to, from time to time, going thirsty. And how all-consuming is that? And the Lord assures us, however, that those that thirst and hunger after righteousness will be filled, and he will satisfy them. So this is the difference between righteousness and unrighteousness. And of course, we realize from other scriptures that Righteousness is a requirement in order to approach God. And so hunger and thirst are extreme needs, and they drive us. They fo drive our focus. And we should be uh, focusing our attention on spiritual things. And that's necessary if we're to transform ourselves to be a reflection of God's character. Next are blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And Merciful is to be compassionate, and it's compassionate with all. So not only our friends and families and loved ones, but also our enemies. And the way that Jesus was compassionate towards all, he gave his life a ransom for ALL to be testified in due time. So the merciful, the blessing that they'll receive is they shall obtain mercy. So it's saying if you're not a merciful person, guess what? You're not going to receive mercy either. So this is such a critical element. And we see how these are building up in progressive steps. And mercy has been described <clears throat> in the study someone brought out. Mercy is unmerited kindness. And what a wonderful viewpoint that is. And you know, when we give unmerited kindness, we really get people's attention because we are walking the walk and not just talking the talk. And they don't expect to, to kindness from us. What does the Lord require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy, and walk humbly with thy God? That's right in line with this beatitude, isn't it? And we're told to love one another with a pure heart fervently. And once again, think about them sitting up on this precipice, overlooking the sea here, and hearing these things, and it was etched in their minds. And, you know, the opposite of merciful is cruel. And we see such cruelty in the world. And so it's saying, no, don't be drawn into that. Don't be, become devices. Be merciful. And so we have the opposite put there. You know, mercy is, oh, God's mercy is unbounded and well beyond anything that man could ever expect. But they will receive it, and it will be wonderful. And only the merciful can receive mercy. So we're, what we're seeing is here is part of these blessings is that we will receive the reciprocal of it as well. We will be given. We will be comforted. We will be filled. We will obtain mercy and so on and so forth. Blessed are the pure in hearts for they shall see God. And pure means clean and heart is the seat of the spirit. And so if we have uh, really continue to, to uh, keep our vessel sacred and to uh, work on uh, sanctification. That's really what this is talking about, being pure in heart. And it's a prerequisite to see God. Very beautiful. You know, and this requires purity in every aspect of our lives as well. Uh, every, every man that hath this hope in him purify himself, and he is pure. And, you know, the, the test is charity out of a pure heart. And so we see here, very clearly laid out in scriptures, yet another step, pure versus impure. 
And so this is pure intention of heart, as we talked about earlier. And there's a distinction between intention and execution. We all fall short, but our intention is what the God is looking at, and God can read the heart. And this really marks freedom in Christ, doesn't it? And finally, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And to be a peacemaker is a, a reconciler, a pacifier. Really, they work actively to reconcile the parties and to pacify any issues. And they solve the problems. They don't cover them up. And it says we must be peacemakers, period. That's a very important thing. And, of course, we realize the wisdom from above is first pure and peaceable and gentle. It sounds just like our Beatitudes, doesn't it? And it says, follow peace with all men, without which no man shall see the Lord. So here again in Hebrews, the Apostle Paul solidifies this statement of what the importance of peacemaking is. And kind of if we went to the opposite, it would be troublemakers. Well, the world is full of troublemakers, and we need to not emulate them but to be peacemakers. And the peacemaking process, this is kind of like the steps that we go up. Once we reach this step of maturity of character, it's an active role. And what you notice is peacemakers build bridges rather than fences. Rather than excluding, they're bringing in, they're reconciling. And this is important because what are we to be in the kingdom? We're to be sympathetic high priests. We're to reconcile mankind. We're to bring people back together. This is when we get practice in peacemaking right now. But we've got to work through all of these steps first. And when we look, we see that there are seven progressive steps of character development. And I know what you're thinking. Well, hold on just a minute. There's, there's additional ones. And there are additional blesseds. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sakes. Blessed are they when men shall revile and persecute you and say all manner of evil and falsely for my sake, for great is your reward in heaven. Well, these are not character attributes. This is what's going to happen because darkness hates the light. Darkness hates the light. And so this is exactly what we would expect. When we reach maturity on this spectrum and we're peacemakers, the world will not like it. And the Lord's saying, great in, in heaven is your reward. Wow, wonderful. And so we might be rename the Beatitudes to the be attitudes. This is what we must become in order to be more than overcomers. These are the be attitudes. We'll close with 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. We thank our Heavenly Father, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To God be the glory forever. Amen.